third time was the charm. <clears throat> hello, hello, everyone. It's good to see you. We are um, going to be doing chapter six of the yearling today. Um, just wanted to kind of catch you up on the story a little bit. Penny is the father. Penny Baxter is his name. Jody is the young boy. Um, I would say he's probably 12 or 13 years old. Not much older than that. Um, he and his father have just gone hunting. They were hunting old Slewfoot the bear. And um, yeah. Let me see if anybody's here yet. Hello. Anyway, <clears throat> and when Penny went to shoot the bear, his gun backfired, which means that he needs a new gun. Now, they have three dogs. Um, one is a bulldog. One is a bloodhound. And the other one is what they call a feist, which is like a little terrier dog. Um, and the little feist was just such a scaredy cat. He didn't go hunt, hunting the bear. Um, let's see. Julia, the bloodhound, was injured in the bear fight. And um, Penny now has to get a new gun. And in order to do that, he's gone over to his in-laws to um, barter or trade the little dog for a new gun. And I want you to see how interestingly he does this. He never tells a lie because it's not part of who he is. He never lies to them. But um, it's very interesting how he does this. I also would like for you to notice the um, the way that children responded to their parents during this time period. Very interesting. So let's get busy. Chapter six of the yearling. The coon sucked greedily at his sugar tea. He lay on his back cupped in Jody's arms and clutched the sugar-filled cloth with his forefeet. He closed his eyes blissfully. His small paunch was already round with milk, and shortly he pushed the sugar teat away and scrambled to be free. Jody lifted him to his shoulder. The coon parted his hair and felt along his neck and ears with, small, with his small, restless hands. His hands is never still. Father Wing said. Pa Forrester spoke from the shadows beyond the hearth. Jody had not noticed him. He sat so quiet. I had me a coon when I were a youngin', he said. He was gentle as a kitten for two years. Then one day he bit a chunk out in my shin. <laughs> he spat into the fire. This one will grow up to bite. It's coon nature. My forester came into the cabin and went to her pots and pans. Her sons trooped in behind her. Buck and Millwheel, Gabby and Pack, Arch and Lim. Jody looked puzzled at the dried and wizened pair that had bred these mountainous men. They were all much alike, except Lim and Gabby. Gabby was shorter than the rest and not unduly bright. Lim alone was clean-shaven. He was as tall as any of them, but thinner and not so dark, and had the least to say. He often sat apart, brooding and sulky, while Buck and Millwheel, the most bo boisterous, caroused. Penny Baxter came in, lost among them. Pa Forrester continued his discourse on the nature of coons. No one listened but Je Jody. But the old man relished his own words. That coon will grow up to where he's big as a dog. He'll whop every dog on the yard. A coon lives for one thing, to whop a dog. 
He'll lie on his back in the water and fight a whole pack of dogs. He'll drown them one by one and bite. A coon will bite one more time after he's dead. Jody was torn between the desire to follow him and his interest in the talk of the foresters. He was surprised to see that his father still carried the worthless spice tenderly in his arms. Penny crossed the room. <clears throat> Howdy, Mr. Forster. Proud to see you. How's your health? Howdy, sir. I'm right smart tolerable, seeing as how I ought be, ne how I be near about done for. True tell I ought to be dead this minute and gone to glory, but I keep putting it off. Seems like I'm better acquainted here, my forester said. Sit down, Mr. Baxter. Penny drew a rocker and sat down. Lim Forrester called across the room. You dog lame? Why, no. I've never known him to go lame. I just figure on keeping him out in the jaws of them bloodhounds of yarn. Valuable, eh? Lim asked. Not him. He ain't worth a good twist of tobacco. Don't you all aim to detain him when I leave here, for he's not worth stealing. You taking mighty good care of him if he's that sorry. So I be. You had him on bear. I've had him on bear. Lim come close and breathe down heavily. Do he track good? Do he tote to hold the bear at bay? He's mighty sorry. Sorriest bear dog I ever owned or followed. Lim said, I never heard a man run down his own dog that way. Penny said, Well, I admit, he's likely looking, and most every man want him looking at him, and I just wouldn't put no notion on a uh, notion of trading in your minds for you'd get fooled and cheated. You figure on hunting on some on your way back? Why, man's allus has hunting on his mind. It's mighty queer you told the dog alone wouldn't be no good to you. The foresters looked about at one another. They fell silent. Their black eyes were riveted on the fox. The dog's no good, and my old muzzle-loading shotgun is no good, Penny said. I'm in a pure fix. The black eyes darted to the walls of the cabin, where the forester arms hung. The array, Jody thought, would stock a gun shop. The foresters made good money trading horses, selling venison, and making moonshine. They bought guns as other men would buy flour and coffee. I never heard tell of you failing to get me, Lim said. I failed yesterday. My gun wouldn't shoot, and when it did, it hit, hit backfired. What was you hunting? Oh, Slewfoot. Ah, ha, roar broke. Where's he feeding? Which way did he come from? Where's he gone? Pa Thorster thumped, his, thumped the floor with his cane. You fellas shut up and leave Penny Telly. He can't tell a thing and you all bellering like bulls. Ma Forrester banged a pot lid and lifted a pan of cornbread as big Jody thought, as a curt syrup cradle. The good smells from the hearth were overwhelming. She said, don't get Mr. Bax to start until he's Ed. Where's your manners? And where's your manners, Pa Forrester reproached his sons, not giving company the chance to wet his whistle before dinner. Millwill went into a bedroom and returned with the demijohn. He pulled out the corn cob stop stopper and handed the jug to Penny. You'll excuse me, Penny said, if I don't drink deep. I ain't got as big a place to put it as you fellers. They laughed uproariously. Millwell passed the jug about the room. Jody? Penny said, he ain't old enough. Pa Forrester said, why, I were weaned on it. Ma Forrester said, pour me a noggin in my cup. She ladled food into pans big enough to wash in. The long trenchered table was covered with steam. There were dried cow peas boiled with white bacon, a haunch of roast venison, a platter of fried squirrel, swamp cabbage, big hominy, biscuits, cornbread, syrup, and coffee. 
A raisin pudding waited at the side of the hearth. If I'd have knowed you was a coming, she said, I'd have cooked something fitting. We'll draw up. Well, draw up. Jody looked at his father to see whether he would. He too was excited by the savory plenty. Penny's face was somehow grave. All this here is fine enough for the governor, he said. Ma Forrester said uncomfortably, I reckon you folks gives thanks to, to your table. Pa, it won't hurt you none to ask a blessing long as we got company. The old man looked about unhappily and folded his hands. Oh, Lord, once more thou done see fit to bless our sinning souls and bellies with good rations. Amen. The foresters cleared their throats and fell too. Jody sat opposite his father and between Ma Forrester and Father Wing. He found his plate piled high. Buck and Millwheel would slip choice morsels to Father Wing. He passed them on under the table to Jody. The foresters ate with concentration. Silence for once. The food melted away before them. An argument arose between Lim and Gabby. Their father pounded on the table with his withered fist. They protested a moment at the intervention, then subsided. Pa Forrester leaned close to Penny and murmured in a low voice, My boys is rough, I know. They don't do what they ought. They drink a heap and they fight and every woman wants to get away from them. Has got to run like a dope. But I'll say this for him. They ain't nary one of them has ever cussed his mammy or his pappy at the table. And that is the end of chapter six. Hope everyone's doing well today. And until next time, may the Lord bless you and keep you. May he make his face to shine upon you and be gracious to you. May the Lord lift up his countenance upon you and grant you his peace. Once again, if you want to reach me, it's M-I-Z-T-U-T-O-R at gmail.com. Ms. Tudor at gmail.com.